So, you live in a big city and you do lots of short trips with lots of cold starts, but you want to maximise the life of your engine and minimise repair costs. Dead easy. Just do these two simple things. I'm Judd Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you could just click the card that's up there now, dude. No Easter Island face for me today. I'm off to pick up a BMW M3 competition. <laughs> and you're not, basically. And I don't know which of those two things makes me happier. I'll have to consider it. Anywho, I've driven about 30 or 40 M3s over the years, I suppose, and they're the closest thing that I can imagine to practical performance car perfection. They really are. They do such a good job with the M3. And I'll be really interested to see what this one is like, if it lives up to expectations past. Anywho, not talking about that today. Talking about you and your car and these short trips and gumming it all up and what causes that and what can you do about it. Because there's so many people, particularly after the pandemic, turning up at the dealership and being stung for 500 or 1000 bucks just to clean up the atherosclerosis in their inlet tract. You know where the inlet goes like this and you just get sort of tunnel vision in there and you know it's dogs and cats living together but you know most of it's preventable and here's how so look if you end up having this conversation at a dealership the first thing you have to realize is that we're talking about a symptom here like the blockage in your inlet tract is a symptom and if you just treat the symptom, like if you just clean it out, it's a bit like taking Panadol for a frigging brain tumour. It might give you a little bit of temporary relief, but not that effective in the domain of cure. And cars have all of these systems, right? And they're quite complex, and we can debate their relative merits all day long, but hey, they exist, right? These systems exist and we have to come to grips with them, okay? And the two that really matter in this case are something called PCV or positive crankcase ventilation, which takes oily vapors from the typhoon in the crankcase and stops it getting pumped out all over the bicycle rider next to you or something and burns it in the engine. So it gets recirculated, PCV, positive crankcase ventilation, and EGR, which is exhaust gas recirculation. And you might hate that too, but the main purpose of EGR is just to increase volumetric efficiency at low load, okay? So just deal with it. It's a net advantage, but there are feedback effects and this could be one. So when you suffer from this kind of blocked up inlet tract problem, you gotta say to the dealer, dude, I want you to look at the underlying systems like the PCV and the EGR just to make sure they're functioning properly. Otherwise, we're just putting a band-aid on the problem. And look at the plumbing as well, like the inlet air plumbing and the associated plumbing to do with the PCV and the EGR. If it's not that, it could be an operational problem, okay, which would be oil dilution. And you go, oil dilution, how does that happen? Essentially, if you do a lot of cold starts, right, your engine parts are not at their optimal size because they're designed to operate at a particular temperature and metal expands when it gets hot, so they get bigger, and then they fit just Goldilocks and your engine operates better. And also your engine operates better when it's warm anyway. So what happens when it's cold is there's all this blow by. There's these gases that blow by the rings and end up in the crankcase and they fall into your oil. The main problem is water because that's a main combustion byproduct and also unburned hydrocarbons like unburned fuel gets down there as well. And if you don't spend enough time actually operating your engine at its normal operating temperature, your oil just gets filthier and filthier and filthier and thinner and thinner and thinner and it leads to this problem where you get more circulating volume than the engine's designed for it it results in more of this oily residue getting sucked into the inlet and then baked on by the EGR and that essentially is the crux of the problem now look you can sometimes confirm this problem for yourself okay because if you park in the same spot you can measure the level of oil in your dipstick all right and if it increases over time if you're always in the same spot 
so the car's reasonably level, but in any case, it's controlled. And then you do it at the same time, like before the first startup every morning or something. If the level incrementally increases like this, then you are having an oil dilution incident and you need to do something about it. And some people say, I'll just fit a catch can or whatever. And to my mind, that's also a bit of a band-aid because the dilution is still happening and you're just catching the vapors on the way to the engine, okay? But diluted oil doesn't protect your engine, so it's gonna wear your engine out more quickly if you just fit a catch can and go two thumbs up, problem solved, right? In other words, it's a bullshit solution. You gotta get to the core of the underlying problem which is you have to get the contaminants out of your engine oil. And the obvious way to do that is just to get out on the highway a little bit more often, meaning let's aim for once a fortnight, okay, for about an hour at 80 to 100 kilometers an hour. So we're talking about doing 80 or 100 kilometers every fortnight out there on the highway in those cruising operating temperature low load situations, all right? It's not that hard to do. Average cars in Australia do 15,000 Ks a year, which is 300 a week or 600 a fortnight. And I'm only talking about going maybe 15% more than that out on the highway, okay? So just pick some location like 40 Ks down the road and just drive there with the family. And hopefully one of the kids will vomit and you'll be able to have a big fat domestic argument. One of them will have a tantrum. It'll be the perfect Australian family outing, all right, but good for your car, okay? 40 k's there, 50 k's there, whatever. Nice view, stony silence, which is good if you're a man because you can just think about stuff. Like there's no obligation to be angry in this situation. Just embrace it, dude, and then drive, you know, the 50 k's back. Job done, okay? Family obligation honored. You've been a good father. So there's all of those things to consider. It's really not that hard, okay? But there is one more thing that you really should do. It's so frigging glamorous being a freelance motoring journalist. Have you noticed? Anyway, let's say you are down this track, okay? And you're becoming a model automotive citizen and they've let you out on parole, okay? You're free to get out on the highway for one hour every fortnight. You've made a firm commitment to yourself and your family to do that. You've purchased a new toothbrush to get the little kitties vomit out of the cracks in the seats, right? All the attendant joy, okay? So you've done that, and what's that really gonna do for you, okay? What it's gonna do is it's gonna have the engine oil in your sump at its optimal operating temperature for a sustained period, and it's going to allow all of those volatile contaminants, like the water and the unburned fuel, just to be fucked off into the air. Well, it's actually gonna get sucked through your engine and burnt, but ultimately fucked off into the air. So that's good, okay? There is, however, one more thing that I strongly suggest you do if you live in a city and you don't drive all that much and most of your driving is this cold start, short trip thing, okay? What I suggest you do is if you've got a 12 month service interval on your car, 12 months or 15,000 Ks would be pretty much industry standard now. And if you do short trips and not much driving, it means you get to the 12 months first, not the 15,000 Ks. And you have to get your car serviced at whichever one comes first. And servicing such a grudge thing for most people, they go, oh shit, I've got to get my car serviced, right? Look at it like this, servicing is prevention. So instead of going to 12 months, if you operate your car in this way, just come back to six, okay? And service the car every six months. In fact, do a full service every 12 months. So let's say you're due for a service in June, all right? Get the full service in June, and then just before Christmas, get an oil change and a filter change, just so you can get rid of any contaminants in the oil that can't be sort of boiled off, all right? If you do that, it is so effective in the domain of prevention and ultimately you will make back every red cent that you spend on that intermediate service. And you will also slash the number of days off the road in the service department while the dealership tries to bend its brain diagnosing some far more convoluted problem that you could easily have prevented in this way. That's pretty much all I've got for you today. So your challenge is to embrace two things, a highway drive once a fortnight and the grudge purchase of a minor service every other six months. Do you reckon you can do it? I tell you what, if you do that, 
I promise to pick up the M3 competition and exercise my full capacity for self-restraint, you know, atrophied though it may be at times. And imagine driving a car like that on our wholly over-regulated and under-engineered road system. I'll let you know what it's like in the next couple of weeks. See ya.